Uh, so last time we ended with this gelfand mazur theorem which says that uh, if A is a unital uh, Banach algebra and so uh, and if we so we have a unital Banach algebra and if every non-zero element is invertible then it has to be the, the scalars and uh, every non-zero element is invertible. So then A is the scalars. And we saw that this was an easy consequence of the fact that any element has a non-empty spectrum. Um, which itself was a consequence of Liouville's theorem from complex analysis. Uh, all right, so today we're going to pick up, where are my notes? Let me grab my notes, I think they're back here. All right, so today we'll continue discussing about the spectrum of an element um, in a Bionic algebra. So. We'll see this a lot in this course for operator algebras that there's a, a, a big connection between topological aspects of these algebras and, um, and algebraic aspects of the algebras. Well, one algebraic aspect is just, are, are you invertible or are you not invertible, right? And so the spectrum, so let me re remind you that the spectrum of an element was by definition the set of complex numbers such that x minus lambda was not invertible. So this is a very algebraic uh, set, uh, and we're going to show that it's connected to the topological aspects. Mainly we're going to connect this to the norm in some way. Uh, so to do this, we'll start with uh, first a lemma. So this is a baby version of the spectral mapping theorem. So it just says that if we have, again, A, a unital uh, Banach algebra, and let's suppose we have some polynomial, F, some polynomial, so K goes from 0 to N, A, K, Z, K, A polynomial. And let's take an element in this Banach algebra, x and a. Uh, so then the spectrum of the uh, f applied to x. So f applied to x, by that I mean you just take z in this polynomial and you replace it with the element in the Banach algebra x. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, and the spectrum of this can be related to the spectrum of x. It's uh, exactly equal to the image of f applied to the spectrum of x. So we can see the, um, the spectrum of f of x from the image of the spectrum of f. So let's prove this lemma. Uh, so we'll prove it by showing each side is contained in the other side. Uh, so I don't know if there's an easier one, uh, but let's first suppose Uh, lambda is in the spectrum of x, and we'll show that f of lambda is in the spectrum of f of x. And so to do that, uh, let's write out what is uh, f of x minus f of lambda. And you see we're going to have uh, some cancellation at the zeroth coefficient, because there, when we plug in uh, f of lambda, we just get a0, and, or f of c, we get a0. So this is exactly going to be the sum, but now k starts from 1 to n, and now we're going to have a k, uh, x k minus lambda to the k. But of course now you all recognize x k minus lambda to the k, x minus lambda is a factor of that. So we can factor out an x minus lambda. So this is x minus lambda times some other element in our Bonnick algebra. 
but the point is, is that if, uh, if x minus lambda is not invertible, which is the assumption, then of course anything times it is also not invertible. So this is not an invertible element of A. Right? So you get that therefore f of lambda is in the spectrum of f of x. Uh, so now we need to show, uh, so that shows one direction, uh, that this is contained in this, so now we need to show the other direction. So we'll do this by showing that anything not in this is not contained in this. So let's take something which is not uh, in the image. So we'll take some complex numbers, uh, which is not in the image of the spectrum of x. All right, so then what can we do? Well, now let's look at uh, f of z minus mu. We'll use the fundamental theorem of algebra and we'll fa completely factor this. Uh, so when we factor this, we're going to have the top coefficient, I guess it's a n, and then we're going to have a z minus some lambda 1, minus lambda 2, minus lambda Right, so it has some factorization. And what do we know? Well, we know that mu is not in the image of f of the spectrum. So whenever we plug an element of the spectrum, we get something non-zero. Well, that exactly says that none of these lambdas are in the spectrum. Right, so since f of lambda minus mu is non-zero for all lambda in this one, x, x, we have that each of these lambda i's are not in the spectrum of x. So they're in the resolvent of x. But what does that mean? That means that when we plug in x, so x minus each lambda i is an invertible element. And here we've just written now, when we plug in x here, we've just written f of x minus mu as a product of invertible elements. So I get that therefore f of x minus mu One minus lambda n is indeed an invertible element, being the product of invertible elements. All right, so that shows uh, the other direction. So this is the limit. Uh, all right, so now the next thing I want to do is relate the spectrum to the norm of an element. Uh, so this is the spectral radius formula. So let's call it a theorem. So again, we're in the same setting. A is a, a unital Banach algebra, so A unital Banach algebra. And we're fixing some x and a. So then we have a nice formula for the, well, I should give a definition first. So set the spectral radius of x to be the supremum over all lambda in the spectrum of x of the absolute value of lambda. This is the yes. uh, so the theorem says that we can compute this without knowing uh, anything explicitly about the spectrum uh, as long as we know the norms of x and its powers. So then the theorem is then the spectral radius of x is the limit as n goes to infinity of the norm of xn, but then we take the nth rule. So in particular, part of the theorem is that this limit exists. Uh, okay, maybe I'll draw a picture which can help to visualize it. So here's the complex plane, and then we have our element x, and it has some spectrum. Uh, all we know about it is it's some you know, non-empty compact set. Maybe it looks like this, maybe it's much more complicated, something like this. Uh, and then we have the spectral radius. So 
I draw this disc right here, and this distance right here is the spectral radius of x. So this is the spectrum of x that I've drawn here. Uh, and then we also have the norm of x, or the norms of the powers of x. Uh, and what do we know? Well, we know that, of course, uh, we did this last time, that if you're close enough to 1, then you're invertible. So in particular, we showed that the spectrum is contained in the unit ball. Uh, as a consequence of that, we had the spectrum was contained in the, in the ball of radius, the norm of x. So we have that this whole spectrum is contained in uh, a ball of the radius norm of x. So we have maybe this ball, maybe it's a larger ball here, and we have that this distance is the norm of x. So it's larger than the spectral radius, or at, at least no smaller than the spectral radius. So this is the picture that we have going on. All right, so now let's prove the theorem. Uh, so uh, again, we'll do this uh, equality uh, in two different ways. We'll show that uh, the spectral radius is less than or equal to the limb inf, and we'll also show it's greater than or equal to the limb soup, and there, so therefore that gives it to us. Uh, so first, let's show that it's uh, less than or equal to the limb inf, and that's not hard to do because of this remark I just told you, that the spectral radius is always, you know, no bigger than the norm. Uh, so in particular, um, and we also know what the spectral radius of the powers of x are because of this theorem we just proved here, so in particular, we know that the spectral radius of x to the n is exactly the spectral radius of x to the n by the lemma we just proved. But on the other hand, we know that this is less than or equal to the norm of x to the n. And taking the nth roots of both sides, therefore, gives us the first inequality. We get that the spectral radius of x is less than or equal to the limb inf as n goes to infinity of the norms of x to the n and then take the nth root. All right, so that direction is the easy direction to prove. So now we have the uh, more difficult direction to prove, and the trick is to uh, use the fact that we also proved last time, and that inversion is not only a continuous function, but it's actually an analytic function. So specifically, if we fix some uh, continuous linear functional on the Banach algebra, so then uh, we showed last time that the function which takes z to the phi applied to z minus x inverse, that this was analytic on the uh, resolvent of x. So this is analytic on the resolvent of x, which is the complement of the spectrum. Right? So wherever it's defined, it's uh, analytic. We know that it's an open set, the result. Uh, so we proved this last time. Uh, so in particular, it's analytic outside this ball of the spectral radius. Uh, so that means that we can have a Laurent expansion. Right? So we get the therefore, let's write out its Laurent expansion. So we get therefore, um, phi, or, yeah, phi of z minus x inverse as the Laurent expansion, we can write it as sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of sum a n over z to the n. And this formula is valid uh, for uh, absolute value of z greater than the spectral radius. All right, we're all happy with that? Okay. But on the other hand, uh, if we're larger than, so that's if we're larger than the spectral radius and magnitude, but if we're larger than the norm and in in, in magnitude, then we also know that it's invertible and we have an explicit formula for the inverse, mainly the geometric series. Right? So recall that if 
we did this last time, that if the uh, absolute value of z is greater than the norm of x, so then, well then that just means that the norm of x divided by the absolute value of z is less than 1, which meant that we had a formula for the inverse, 1 minus x over z inverse was exactly the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n over z to the n. All right, so now if we uh, pull out uh, z, so we have another formula, and if we apply phi to it, we can apply this uh, element-wise, this is a conver absolutely convergent sum. Uh, and so now we can find another formula for this, so we get that therefore, v of z minus x inverse is equal to what? So we pull out uh, uh, 1 over z, so this is uh, 1 over z, now we have the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of phi to the xn over z to the n. Hmm? All right, so this means, uh, and this is valid, this formula is valid for absolute value of z greater than the norm of x. Hmm? Uh, but now here, at least larger than the norm of x, we have two Laurent expansions for the same function, so we know by the uniqueness of Laurent expansion that they're the same coefficients. All right, so we get therefore, so we get therefore that we have a formula for a n, a n is equal to, I guess there's a shift here, so it'll be phi to the x n minus one. Uh, I think so. All right, something like this uh, for large n. Um, Okay, so what do we have now? We have with this power series here that this is absolutely convergent whenever z is greater than this, and we have explicit coefficients. And so therefore, in particular, since it's absolutely coefficients, absolutely convergent, we know the coefficients and absolute value go to zero. So we get that therefore, the absolute value of phi x n minus one uh, over z goes over z to the n, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And this is true whenever z is greater than the spectral radius. Uh, uh, all right, but that should just about uh, finish the proof for us. Um, because uh, in particular, this says that if we take the nth roots here, then uh, we get that um, whenever z is greater than the spectral radius, uh, if we take the, oh, so one more thing, that since this goes to zero, and this is true, so this is whenever z is greater, absolute value of z is greater than the spectral radius, and remember that this was for an arbitrary linear functional. And All right, but that means that here the sequence xn over z to n satisfies the property that you apply any linear functional to it and it goes to zero. By uniform boundedness principle, that tells us that the norm this goes to zero. So therefore, therefore, we have that the norm of x to n minus one over absolute value of z goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Um, again, whenever. z is greater than the spectral radius, and this is by the uniform boundedness principle.
And then this finishes the proof because we have therefore that the, um, uh, what was our claim? That the spectral radius of x, so we already proved up there, was less than or equal to the limb inf, but we get now that it's greater than or equal to the limb sup as n goes to infinity of the norm of xn to the one over n. Because if this wasn't greater than or equal to it, that would allow us to choose some z such that this kind of hold. Okay, any questions about that? So that's the spectral radius formula. Uh, it has a nice consequence, especially for C star algebras, because C star algebras, um, we know how to relate the norm of a power to the norm of the element in many situations. So specifically, here's the definition. We'll say that X uh, and A, so at this time we need an, a Banach al algebra with an involution. So if A is a Banach algebra with involution. So then X and A is normal if X star X uh, is equal to X X star, so X and X star commute, uh, and X and A is self adjoint. if it's actually equal to its adjoint. And obviously self-adjointness implies normality. Um, and now we have the following consequence of the spectral radius formula, and that is that if X is self-adjoint, or if X is normal, so then, uh, we get that the spectral radius of x star x is bounded by the spectral radius squared. Moreover, if we have a C star algebra, so this is true for any Banach algebra with involution, uh, and if we have a C star algebra, A is a C star algebra, then we have equality. And this is, of course, very nice because these are easier to compute the spectral radius of uh, self adjoint elements. X star X is always self adjoint, of course. Uh, so let's go ahead and give a proof of this. Uh, and this is a very easy consequence of the spectral radius formula. Uh, so mainly the spectral radius of x star x is the limit as n tends to infinity of the norm of x star x to the nth power and take the nth root. But of course uh, x and x star commute since they're normal by hypothesis, which means we can rewrite this as the limit as n goes to infinity of the norm of x, and of course taking the adjoints commutes with powers, so you can write this as uh, x to the n star x to the n, and 1 over n. Now we can use the Banach uh, norm estimate, so this, so this is less than or equal to the product of these norms. Uh, use the fact that the involutions are isometric, and so we see that this is less than or equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n 2 over n, which is the spectral radius of x squared. Uh, moreover, if we have a C star algebra, then the only thing in this inequality we have right here uh, is notice that here we can use the C star algebra identity, which says we have equality here. So this is equality in a C star algebra. All right, so uh, we can compute 
Yeah, so if we have, um, so we have this nice relationship between the spectral radius of x and the spectral radius of x star x. And like I said, this makes computations a lot easier, especially in a C star algebra, because on the left is always a self-adjoint uh, element. In fact, we get the nice proposition directly from this, and that is that if A is a unital C star algebra, and X and A is normal, so then the spectral radius of X is exactly equal to the norm of X. So this picture I drew here for normal elements of a C-star algebra, this is equal. So if you drop the normality assumption here, uh, this is not true in general. In fact, uh, I'll leave it to you guys as a nice exercise to construct uh, inside of B of H an element whose uh, spectrum consists only of the zero uh, a singleton, but it's a non-zero element. So this is a nice exercise to think about. Uh, is not not difficult to do. Okay, um, but for normal elements, this can't happen. We always have this equality. So let's go ahead and prove this. Uh, so let's first prove this for self-adjoint elements. So first, suppose x is self-adjoint. Uh, how does that help? That helps because we can now have that uh, self-adjoint implies normal, so we can 